Good afternoon, everybody. How are we doing today? Alex here, as always, um, for the Festival of Enterprise, and I am joined by Raisa and Joyce de Haas from Double Dutch Drinks. How are we doing, ladies? Hello. Very good. How are you? I'm very good, thank you. Uh, the UK has changed for some nicer weather. I can see people posting up here as well. So, hi, Corinne. Hey, Warren. Hey, Chris. Hey, Laura. Um, who else have we got? We've got Louise. We've got Jao in, our, in um, Canada as well. Louise from Buckinghamshire. Got questions already. So, this is awesome, guys. Uh, Soki from Cardiff, my hometown. How are you doing? Um, <laughs> so um harry from richmond jazz from wolves people flying in this is brilliant so um if you've got any questions um then post them up the easiest i know you've got an ask a question button there everyone but if you post them up in the chat um then rice and joyce get to see them as well otherwise i will moderate them from the, the little button i've got down here as well um so if you haven't met them before we're talking building a brand today um, so I first came across you guys with Virgin Startup, actually, probably, cool, what are we talking, four or five years ago? Did you start yeah, yeah. 2014, 2015? 15, yeah. 2015, yeah. Uh, and it was probably with the, with the Foodpreneur competition that I think Richard kicked off in, in the first year or so. Am I right? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, did, did you get, did you... Did you get to go to the States or you, you won part of that competition? Was that right? Yeah, we won the Foodpreneur Awards from Richard Branson uh, about six months after we launched in 2015. And then he flew us over to the US to pitch for Target, That's which right. was amazing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, with the guy who does like the, um, oh, what was his name? With the, like, um, Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. Yeah. Met him as well. Yeah, yeah. So that was what, yeah, so five years ago now. And, and since then, um, you've obviously, I remember before you've been featured in like Forbes 30 under 30 list. Um, correct me with the figures that our guys have put up here, but it says you sold 10 million bottles um, and are carried in four and a half thousand outlets worldwide, including Michelin star restaurants and luxury hotels such as the Savoy and the Mandarin Oriental. Sounds about right. <laughs> Is that right? Okay, very good. Um, so, First question to you. So at the moment, you're both um, in lockdown in Belgium. Yes, Usually in, the, in London, living in London, yes. where you went to uni. Yeah. Um, do you normally live together when you're in London or is this like kind of enforced during lockdown to work <laughs> together <laughs> in the nicest possible way? <laughs> normally we don't live together, but we were already living um for the past six months together because of kind of circumstances but we yeah. were just about to move out uh separately when the lockdown happens so now we're gonna be together for almost a year so we're lucky we didn't kill each other yet <laughs> <It's all laughs> Indeed. yeah and um a question like for people might want to know and i think probably crops up a fair bit how do you divide up responsibility who does what in in the company and you've obviously got a team because i've met you uh, met you in london and and, and seen where, you, where your hq is there as well but yeah how are things divided up for between you guys it always it started from like this naturally and then it's still the same so i'm responsible for everything finance operation and export sites and then rice is responsible for everything marketing uk um and sales site okay um, and first question with regards to the kind of circumstances at the moment that we're asking everyone. So when lockdown happened, when coronavirus was first in the news, um, what happened with you guys when you, when you first heard about it? What happened to you like personally in your business? What, what was your first reaction? <laughs> I think for us, it was really, we were quite um, pessimistic about it because we used to be super focused on, and most of our revenues came from restaurants, bars, hotels. So yep. that obviously completely fell away. Um, but it hasn't been as bad as we thought it would be. Our online sales have picked up really uh, good. Our retail has been amazing. And we just launched, um, because of the uh, lockdown, really quickly an online shop on our website um, about four weeks ago now. And that's doing really well. So there is a silver lining. It's not as bad as we thought. That's good, yeah. Because I, I, I and it wasn't on a webinar. This was a separate one for the podcast last week. But I, I chatted to Josh White from Can of Water. Don't know if you know those yeah. guys. 
Um, and he, he said everyone was like phoning him up going, God, you guys must be killing it at the moment. Everybody needs water. Everybody's at home. Everybody needs water. He said, do you know what? He said, we've lost about 95% of our revenues. And I was just like, oh, yeah. whoa. Yeah. Just because so many of them is, is that purchase when you're you know doing your meal deal at Tesco's, you're buying your lunch and you're at the counter yeah. and there's the can and you know that kind of impulse purchase that just, just isn't possible at the moment. So um, yet we've had other businesses on I had like Danny Gray from War Paint for Men, like the men's makeup brand, had like nourished the 3D printed vitamins, and they were all like 300% up on what they would normally be doing at the moment. So it's really interesting finding out how people are doing. And, and I did wonder because I know, you know, a large proportion of your business um, traditionally has been in, you know, like restaurants, bars, that kind of thing. Uh, so how much is that? Is that literally just that part falling off the edge of a cliff, but the, the, the retail, the online has picked up and you've kind of balanced it out or... Yeah, yeah. So the Horeca Bars, Restaurants, Hotels has yeah fallen out, completely gone overnight. Um, but mm. our retail and our online have grown over fifteen hundred percent in the last couple of weeks. So we've seen massive growth there, massive volumes. And I think the the really interesting thing is is that this probably in the long in the long term this is gonna give us a higher advantage and it's gonna give yeah. us more revenues than we initially forecasted for because i think you can't take that away anymore that growth online you're really we're now building a bigger loyal customer base and then once the on trade goes open again hopefully we'll have the massive growth of retail and back have the on trade so yeah i don't know i think yeah. it's also interesting to see like how quickly if you're pushed into a certain situation you can quickly pivot your business if you're big and small enough so mm. i think in inside it's been okay for us yeah 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 no so, uh was it simon uh put great great work on the pivot um he, he's put we as a digital business have got busier to be expected uh look after the increased business and motivate them to propel you further yeah it's funny isn't it because you think you know we've been in a digital age for a very long time but that many businesses um hadn't really optimized their online offering and this is like push people into doing that you know we're the same we're, we're meant to be at we're meant to have been at Olympia in London last week with 5,000 people, but instead we're doing 15 hours of content for the last six weeks on here instead, you know, keeping people um, interested and up to date in what's happening in the, in the entrepreneurship space. So, um, so that is, that is really interesting. And I don't know if you, I mean, you've probably seen as well, like the stats just in like the, the alcohol consumption was like 25% increase in the UK, 55% in America. I was like, what the hell? I suppose if you've got Trump for a president, then you're going to turn to Trump. But, <laughs> Um, maybe I can't be political on here. I don't even know. But um, yeah. yeah, I mean, even just seeing it from a personal point of view, like, you know, my wife, uh, you know, with the gin and tonics now, like on a daily basis, going to either the corner shop if you can't get to the supermarket, things like that. Um, so I, I could well imagine that um, you, you have seen increased sales. And how far, how long did it take you um, since lockdown to, to, to actually come up with that like new offering and to actually get that up and running and fully organized? Um, so the lockdown was announced on the 23rd and then we wow. launched our web shop on the 29th. So really quickly. Whoa. Really good. Yeah. How, how did, what were the kind of steps you, you, you did to do that? Did you manage to uh, literally outsource that? You, you know, literally picked up the phone and said, this is what we need to do. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, we built it. Uh, we built the Shopify website ourselves. <laughs> so we launched, Brilliant. in all honesty, with lots of glitches. <laughs> yeah, of uh, and with a, quite an ugly <laughs> Shopify site, but at least we launched. And then we kind of just made it better along the way. Um, yeah. Hope, and, and, I, I think it's fine now. Yeah. And, and how have you got the? How have you kind of focused on getting the getting the word out to your your existing customers? Um, if you, is it been like you know through email has it been social has it been uh, you know a, a mix really because i guess you've got um i guess you know it must be tricky like you say with with like the hotels and, and the restaurants things like that so did you have a, a significant like list of customers that you could you could hit up like by email or is it more like social media marketing to, to build awareness of what you were doing it's only social media we've got a good uh, following and, and um, good engagement there. So we push it mostly via social media, be only organic so far, but we are, are now going to invest in advertisement as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. I think we were lucky enough that we also like to our network and like shareholders and customers 
the lots of them are then referring it to their friends and we definitely have seen like lots of support there um so yeah i think it's more real world and digital yeah for us email and newsletter isn't we send it out but our engagement yeah. on our newsletters isn't really uh massively yeah yeah no but you know i think that's probably <laughs> you know reflective isn't it like you know like a what's considered a really good email open rate is still only something ridiculous like 20 odd percent depending on simon might be able to um give me more scope on that um being in the digital space but um that's what i was always always led to believe um let me uh, I'll put one of the questions at you from from the audience to keep people engaged on here um which which leads nicely into that there you go he says 26 percent open rate there you go um I'm, i know mine's 20 something as well so that's, uh, that's interesting um so how important this is from peers how important is it to encompass all social media platforms whilst building a brand or will just a couple do eg instagram pinterest etc what, what do you guys focus on i'm assuming instagram but uh that your products would lend themselves you got the product there to hold up so people can see actually i'm sure you must have Hey, uh, <laughs> <there you go. laughs> um, we'll be sharing discount codes and everything for the web shop label. Yes, I should have said that at the beginning, shouldn't I? Yes, we'll be doing that. <laughs> uh, I think for us, we very much focus on Instagram. Um, but I think our most of our engagement with our consumers is on Instagram. But then we do get more conversions from Facebook. Um, and those are definitely our two. I mean, Instagram is our main, main focus. But it's interesting to see now with a web shop that more conversions do come from Facebook. Yeah. yeah. And for example, we do like these action to calls on like, for example, every Tuesday we do this drop off for somebody, for people to nominate somebody they uh, think deserves a presence that week. Mm -hmm. And while we have so much more following on Instagram compared to Facebook, our engagement for that on Facebook is massively higher than on Instagram, but then other hmm. pictures, for example, are much higher on Instagram, but just really starting to learn how it's all connected and what works on Facebook more than on Instagram, I think. Nice, nice try, Jazz. He's, he's already um, downscaled from the, uh, <laughs> from the, from the discount, discount culture, for example. Yeah. <laughs> That's as good as it gets. <laughs> as good as it gets at this time. Absolutely. Whereas if you'd been in London and you're doing like a little, um, you know, hot spot where people are going by and sampling and tasting, it would be a different story, but we're not allowed that human interaction yet. <laughs> um, do you do you guys think, I mean, just something that I've been thinking more and more of like over the last couple of days, um, because we missed our event in London, I was thinking, what's your perspective, again, being in a different country as well, um, do you think that people are, are gonna crave human contact again and that kind of connection by going to a restaurant going to a bar going to a hotel or do you think and we don't have a crystal ball i know but you know you're just your personal opinion or do you think people are still going to be you know anxious and scared of actually going out and meeting other human beings i think for me the first thing i'm gonna do is go to the pub and go out and <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. um, i think people will do really want to go out again and have social contact. I think just maybe in moderation and with trying to have a little bit more distance. I can't see myself going to the club and really stand like this, no. um, like cornered like sardines, but yeah. just nice in, at a, in an open space in a beer garden. Um, mm. Yeah, and, and I think outside spaces, I think it's now gonna be summer. I think just social distancing. I do think, for example, like, when you meet somebody kissing that giving them a kiss to say hello those kind of things probably maybe a little bit less but just having a drink together mm. i also think premium outlets are probably gonna be being less suffering than the mainstream yeah. pubs maybe i think right. yeah i think the higher end restaurants membership clubs like lots of people are maybe gonna feel a little bit more safer there that's a good idea yeah this. That is a good idea. I didn't think of that. Yeah, membership clubs. That's that. Yeah, especially like L London and that. And I think like the more high-end um, establishments. And again, I do hope you know, like you say, summer is you know feels like it's it's literally here. And to be able to, you know, those establishments that have got outdoor spaces and can afford to open with social distancing. Because I've seen a lot of you know friends who are restaurateurs down here on the south coast and saying, you know, if we're having to open up and it's you know 
fifty percent maximum, it, it doesn't make sense from an overhead yeah, point of view to to even open. So yeah, uh, it's difficult. Yeah, um, let's have a quick. Yeah, that's right. Warren says, and the Dutch kiss three times as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is very true i do remember that yeah simon says i think people will be nervous but long term i think it will be okay yeah i hope people don't you know have to wait for a you know an antidote to this because like with other diseases yeah. that i've never found an antidote for you know um uh, let's have a look. What else have we got here? Question for later. Do you think engaging a PR company is worthwhile? I recently asked a PR specialist to help me with a small lockdown company I'm running. Um, co competition I'm running was sent to a lot of people, but no one has picked up on it. Felt like a waste of time and money. Uh, what's your experience? Uh, are, you, are you using PR at the moment? Because we had somebody on recently and they were they, their um, thoughts were that you should actually not be doing a huge amount of PR at the moment, unless it was, you know, a kind of feel good story. Otherwise there's so much scope for people overreacting to things at the moment because people are kind of anxious and scared and all those kinds of things. Um, yeah, what are your thoughts on, on PR at the moment? I do, in general, I do believe, believe more in PR and getting genuine interviews and genuine media coverage versus traditional advertisements. I think then PR is, way more worth uh, the money. I think in these times, it's difficult. I think trying to get coverage out of a co the crisis seems a little bit authentic maybe, and mm. could backfire easily. <laughs> um, so I think trying to, we are not really going out with PR at the moment, apart from just the usual kind of cocktail recipe IDs and um, stuff, but we yeah. do ha we have used the pr agency the past 12 months and before we used other pr agencies i do think i think what raisa says it's all about having an authentic story and a pr agency can help you getting your words out there more in a genuine way rather than investing in advertisements um but i think it's important with pr agencies that you take a pr agency that's really focused in your own industry and they have the context in the industry and the right journalists mm. um, uh, um i think it's worth it yeah yeah no good good point um, and i will go back before i lose it in the questions um there was somebody who posted up earlier yeah harry um elrington says how did you scale up your business during the beginning so yeah going back i was going to ask you a couple of questions though so rewinding for uh, five or six years time so you started the business, I remember, when you both had moved to London to go to a university at UCL, yeah? Yeah. Um, and I was wondering how many of those lessons are kind of relevant today because I remember reading um, that when you launched, you weren't, you know, 100% happy with the brand and all the rest of it and how it looked, but you just wanted to get out there, you know, to try to start generating revenue, et cetera. How many of those kind of lessons do you think could be applicable now for people who are literally, you know, stuck at home, they can't go out, but they're having to pivot, they're having to um, either, either change direction for the business or even start new businesses. I've seen a friend of mine, Sabrina, who's um, a semi-finalist on The Apprentice, she lost, launched the business literally two weeks ago called shoppingslots.co.uk and um, had over a million website visits in, um, in like 10 days and crashed, crashed the site down and everything. Um, like 50,000 subscribers, literally <laughs> went berserk. So, um, yeah, interested to know your thoughts. What do, what do you think with regards to um, starting out in these times, lessons learned? Um, I think on like um, offering a product that you think isn't really right at the beginning, I think still that, that applies, but I do think it only applies for a physical product. It really doesn't apply for a service or a website or technology. technology. I think mm. a product people, as long as it tastes good, people can forgive whether the design isn't really 100% on point or whether, I don't know, your crown cap isn't opening as smooth as it should be. I think that's forgivable mistakes. And I think you can learn along the way to improve it, to really increase your customer experience. I think with services, that's definitely not, I think you need to have a perfect service or whatever on that side um and i think it's super important to have when you start to have a niche and a focus um and not try to go behind like take every opportunity or every sales you can have i think it's really important to know 
who your first customers are that you want to target, what your price point is, what the location is that you're geographically you want to target, and don't get really sideways by maybe opportunities to immediately take it everywhere and anywhere. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and when, when you started, was your, was your, was your focus um, very much set on um, like the physical locations, like the restaurants, the, ho the hotels? Yeah, so we definitely, we went, so in the first three months, we only focused on bars, restaurants, hotels that were around Mayfair, Marleybone, and so in the West End, there at least the five star uh, hotels and mission star restaurants and the speakeasy, super expensive bars. And that was really to set the premium standards. And I think that was the right thing to do because from there we could say, oh, we are in the Dorchester. And then it was easier to go into, I don't know, Harvey Nichols. And then we could say, yeah. are we, or Nichols is listing us, so then it was easy to go to Selfridges. And I think having that proper focus really enabled us to probably grow quicker after a while. Yeah, good question. Um, Simon says, I think I know the answer, but are you able to supply nationwide? Yeah, I mean, you're pretty global now, aren't you? <laughs> nationally and internationally. And Everywhere. Internationally. Yeah. yeah, so what, what countries... Um, that's an interesting question as well. Um, so yeah, what countries do you supply to at the moment? And can you see um, the different, how things have gone like over the last six weeks? I was looking at podcast stats before and seeing how they've gone up. But um, are you able to see the difference in, in at the moment, like six weeks? Have you got kind of like a heads up on how that's changed? Um, I think for us, so we are supplying to about 25 countries where we work with retailers and um, bars and restaurants. I think nice. for us, so it's kind of skewed for us a little bit. We see the, the countries where we are more retail focused than bars and restaurants are obviously doing a lot better at the moment. Um, so I can't really give you a... Yeah, but maybe important to say on our web shop, so what we only launched about a month ago, we launched with the UK, we're trying to get all the mistakes out of it, and then yeah. we're uh, yeah. launching globally. So we're now launching next week in the Benelux and then taking it to Germany and then going from there. Um, but international international direct deliveries it's it's quite challenging um so hopefully that will be set up in the next two to three months probably only yeah yeah um jazz says um on your initial contact with your with your customers was the res what was the response to you and the product on your initial contact with your customers yeah what was the response to you guys and to the product um good obviously <laughs> I hope, okay. Uh, I think five years ago, definitely, uh, I think people like a genuine story and, and founder-led uh, brand. So I think that was positive. Um, we are definitely in a very male-dominated industry. And I think you can see that from two sides, it, it can be a negative and can be a positive. Uh, so I try to look at it from a positive and that we are more rememberable. Um, and I think on our product, in the beginning, we definitely had, our product was always fine, but we... Our branding was terrible. We had the most envious labels. We had one day in the beginning, a customer who told us, I love your product, but I won't stock it because I won't want my customers to see such um, stuff. No, um, wow. that's feedback. Branding. So then we just decided we need to rebrand now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, which we did, and then it was fine, and we got that customer. Um, so yeah. Yeah, I love, I love yeah. your branding, but I, 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 I guess I don't remember the, uh, the old branding <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i won't show you <laughs> okay um warren says um uh, trying to uh, through distributors or or direct um through distributors I, i'd imagine i might be wrong yeah always so all we started via distributors um and that's also our main business the first time that we've ever gone direct is now via our online web shop and with yeah. distributors we usually work with one importer in each country exclusively um, and they then work with their yeah. local wholesalers. However, in the UK, we work with multiple distributors together. Yeah. 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 Um, and yeah, so we get that, get questions, a few of these questions of a similar, um, line for, for, for most of the webinars. And I think it's, it's a, it is a genuine question. So Simon and Romali say similar questions. So, um, it seems to be. I don't know. I think when we started, maybe five or six weeks ago, people were, were coming on the webinars and who, you know, who business owners, and they were said they were scared to be being seen to sell their products, to be kind of, you know, overtly marketing their products. 
Um, and I had uh, founder of Antler, Magnus Grimmeland on, um, and he was saying, at the end of the day, if you're providing you know, a service, you're solving a problem, you owe it to yourself to tell everybody who you are and, and what you can do. Um, you'll only you know, look back on this period and, and kick yourself if you, if you weren't continuing to provide that. So yeah, wh where do you feel on when people saying comments like, did you get any negativity from people saying, now is not the time for business? during coronavirus or um, a Ramali says, do you feel bad to go all out to sell your products at a time like this when people are financially struggling? You know, those kind of questions crop up quite a lot. Yeah, uh, I think we are definitely not going all out uh, for business. We are not selling at all to B2B. We're not trying even to sell. We're just staying in contact with our and seeing if they want literally free stock or uh, if we, they want some free resources on the other. So we're only giving support for free and we're not selling at all because I do mm. think B2B is completely the wrong time. Um, yeah. But I think to consumers, it's something, I think that's a different thing. People are still consuming food and drinks. And yeah. if we are launching our own web shop, people can still choose to not buy it with us. We're not throwing it in someone's um, right. throat. I mean, people can just buy it if they want it or not. I mean, I don't think there's anything wrong with uh, direct yeah. to consumer. But I do think like the second when lockdown happened, we immediately like called our whole sales team and said like, you need to stop selling. Like we don't want you to call up customers and even try in the tiniest second, try to sell them stuff because for Who's us, all their customers, like they just literally heard that they needed to close their doors. And that they needed to put all their stuff either on foral or, or, or get them out of the business and they have so many expenses so i think for us it's all about we are quite strong in keeping contact with our customers but it's more offering the support and then hopefully after this crisis obviously it is with something in mind like they can see us as a brand that was there to support and yeah. not necessarily there to yeah i i, I agree um and i, I think I, I can understand why people um, are a bit reticent about that as well and people have got different experiences but as I was saying to you guys before we came online uh, and those people here might not have been on those webinars but you know I had Danny Gray from Warpaint for Men, I had uh, Melissa Snover from um, Nourished and, and they were doing like 300% more sales than they normally would because they're products that people want more of. Um, that's simply what happened you know let, let the market decide but I think it is a difficult one uh, to be seen like, you know, overtly pushing your, your products on someone. Crikey, we're literally getting questions flying in. So I'm going to, I'm going to shut up and going to go to these questions instead of rabbiting on myself. So um, here we go. Let me scroll all the way back up. Um, you're welcome. Warren, Simon, always interesting to answer as some businesses have been scared. We haven't been scared at all. No, I agree with you. Um, Jazz, if you can pinpoint one thing that you can attribute your success to, what would it be? Mm. <laughs> um, I think getting um, uh, awards and endorsements from bigger companies and people that are well known to kind of just gain credibility. I think we got, even if it's award that no, awards that nobody ever heard of, just getting some kind of credibility behind you did really help us in the beginning. Um, I think maybe also important, not necessarily only famous people also like mentors and supporters like when we started we were so young we started in a country where we didn't know any we never in the industry before so having like people that really giving us advice helped with our network that has been the main thing how we yeah that's started the in the end and then i think dedication yeah. and i think you need to build a business that you're super passionate about and that you really love because the first three years are just Pretty shit. <laughs> <laughs> or at least a oh, lot of work. <laughs> a lot of work, absolutely. Um, Harry says, when building your brand, did you consult with digital marketing companies or did you build organically? I think you said organically before, didn't you? Yeah. 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 Thought so. Um, Monica, what are the three main things you would have done differently along your journey? Oh, only three. I think we can all pick more than that. Yeah. You only get three, one and a half each. <laughs> um, I think so it was many. so many, but um, <laughs> definitely keep more structure and organization of everything. Everything. <laughs> I think I if know. I look at like our mailing list, or like 
contacts or business cards or people leads. are meeting or leads that we ever did like we never we only started with salesforce literally four months ago i mean what a waste of time and i think that then too i think we made a lot of mistakes on hiring too much um on for the exact, hire? yeah under hype and try to hire in a lean way so we hire the financial position for the, where the business was at that time, but then eight months later, the business was outgrowing that person. I think that was more time consuming and probably more lost, expensive, more expensive yeah, than yeah. if we would just have hired somebody more senior from the start. Yeah, those were also my two things. <laughs> uh, I mean, there are so many mistakes. I mean, um, so, uh, well, yeah. Um, <laughs> um, I think uh, with like everybody, everything who you work with, either shareholders or stakeholders, yeah, making sure that you get along on a personal. personal level as well. It's not just about what those people in theory could bring into the business. You really need to get involved or need to get along on a personal level uh, because you're stuck with each other for the next seven years or how at least so yeah and i think that is with every both suppliers yeah. shareholders employees i think it's really important to look at it from a personal level as well yeah uh just says great support ethic i take my hat off to you both ramali says thanks um tui says uh is an interesting one this one is always interesting if you could speak to your younger selves when just starting the business what would you tell them <laughs> um don't do it <laughs> don't do it, do it. um i think there's like light in the end of the tunnel i think at the beginning it's so hard and you get so many no's um and i think that's quite draining at the beginning especially because you're just with the or we were lucky enough that we were at least with the two of us uh but lots of people start their business with your no. own you don't have support yet no. uh you don't have people that can help you yet so yeah but in essence i think every business needs to go through that first yeah and i I'll definitely think just keep tra track of stuff better don't just get along from day to day i think we if we would have been more organized um things have would have been better <laughs> <laughs> It's difficult though, isn't it? Because, it, you know, to start with, no matter what it is, everybody to a certain degree is is making it up as they go along. And you're trying to hang on to the coattails, you know, when you do get some momentum and some traction. So the, the admin and the organization, and I'm the same, just the first thing that goes, unfortunately. But yeah, I, I think you're right. If you could kind of go back and set up those, those kind of building blocks uh, to, to have a solid base, then they, they would stand you in a, in a good stead. Um, a couple more questions. So Dale says, you mentioned business cards as a way of growing your business. How do you feel about the use of business cards now? Do you feel they still have a place? Good question. Especially now with no contact due to coronavirus, would a digital contact card, digital contact card that can be sent via any means be a helpful tool? Hmm. Could I be a sales think... going. <laughs> <laughs> I think you didn't really, or I would don't mean literally business cards. I think literally just keeping track of everyone yeah. I've ever met, even if it's just I'm, dinner. Yeah, but even if it's, for example, like marketing agencies that, that I met over the past three years, if I just kept track of it, but also, for example, customers uh, or bars, um, the buyers of it, or CVs from people we yeah. interviewed three years ago. We, couldn't mm. afford them back then. Yeah. If I would have kept those CVs. I think it's more about it's not definitely not the business cards because I definitely didn't keep the business cards, <laughs> obviously. No. Um, but it's more about keeping track of your whole information and your network. And I don't I think there is no space for net, for uh, business cards anymore. I think now Everything if is cash is going out yeah. uh, and it's not happening anymore, business cards definitely think that people are not gonna get it right anymore. And we did not use a CRM system and we did not keep their details. <laughs> <laughs> but when I was like, it took us about in like month 15 
for people to trying to get into our inbox and like trying to get every email out of it and putting it in a CRM system. So by the end of 2020, I'm very hopeful that we will have everything back in one file. <laughs> yeah, you know, I was chatting to a friend of mine did a webinar for us yesterday on, on selling a guy called Umesh and, and, um, and he was saying what him, um, he has this, like a supper club in London and he was saying what him and his team are doing at the moment is organizing their network into like these are you know investors and these are you know this is marketing and i was like geez i would i would love to have somebody do that to my network because i yeah. constantly you know people ask you can you you know recommend some investors can you recommend i'll just it's all just in there i just couldn't put it into segments for you that easily you know yeah. um thanks for your answer mm. Um, I do have a great, I do have a great tool for you, Dale says. Go on, Dale. Put, you know, I'm always happy for people. I've said this in every webinar to post up your URL, like a website or anything that anyone would find yeah. helpful, um, and people to post up their LinkedIn profile so they can network. This is like you know virtual networking, um, and I'm gonna, I'll post mine up as well. But you know, I, I haven't had business cards, for example, for two years, and I've been doing like events all over the country. And I always just say, you know, I'm really easy to find. Alex Chisnell on LinkedIn. There's only one of me. And it, it's far easier because you just know when you come back from an event with a load of business cards, it goes in the drawer or straight to the bin, yeah. um, unfortunately. Um, okay, so where – I think I had another one I missed out. Let's have a look. Uh, oh, yeah, Romali. Um, how many products did you start or stop before focusing on this product group? We started – with Dubbledge uh, and never stopped or changed. Uh, so we launched with our cucumber watermelon and our pomegranate and a basil, two really different types of flavors. At that point, when we started Dubbledge, we probably never thought we would expand the range to like uh, flavors, to Indian tonic or skinny tonic or ginger beer. We thought we would become a mixer company that only does like innovative and really different types of flavor combinations. Uh, and then quite early on, it just appeared that people loved the different flavors, but they wanted to have one mixer brand behind the bar and don't have a cucumber watermelon of Double Dutch, an Indian tonic of, God knows what other brand. Um, so then God we knows. expanded our range. <laughs> I wouldn't know. Oh, uh, no. <laughs> so then they, we just expanded our range to one having the standard, uh, really amazing Indian tonic, skinny tonic, ginger beer, ginger ale, and then expanding our um yeah our innovative flavor combinations but we never we have never delisted a product in our range and we also never did any other products before really so no, none in like five years haven't delisted anything it's just wow no amazing um, yeah we've done like limited editions but we always launch them and tell us about so i was going to ask you this might lead me on to the next question i was going to ask you about have you been experimenting during this time with like any new flavors but um have you um you've been using your tonic thursdays like on instagram um have, have you been yeah experimenting with any new flavors during this time oh, yeah definitely me. we've got some great flavors coming up <laughs> we were launching actually normally uh we were supposed to launch two uh flavors um before august but we postponed everything uh, a little bit um so we'll see we lost you alex Did yeah you, your your um your video's gone so i thought i would knock mine out to try and it's, it's always the ah. bandwidth and people's internet connections yes we can't see you but maybe that's just again where i am who's online who can see who let me know can you see uh right <laughs> in voice? or can you just see me unfortunately <laughs> um <laughs> yes okay so so yeah tell us tell everybody so again it's you know what I, I love seeing is you know different um changes you've made to your business there you go you're back um you can see us both okay maybe it's my internet connection there you go um so yeah so um different changes you've made you mentioned like the competition you have where people get to nominate uh, someone um tell everybody about a little bit about your tonic thursdays and you've, you've done quite a number of different partnerships i've seen with different people in different spaces as well so there will be one tomorrow at 5 p.m am i right yes <laughs> tell everybody so we're just about doing <laughs> we're doing kind of insta lives on uh, every thursday at five um where we are interviewing um uh everyone from a different industry every week basically we've had some uh artists um we had a cook uh cooking with double dutch flavors 
We had a nutritionist last week. We had we are uh, having a barbecue um, in a few weeks' time, and we're kind of doing live demonstrations about not just the tonic industry or not just cocktails, um, but also other kind of demonstrations, like for example, drawing lessons. We had an um, yoga, yoga team. teacher where we did some meditation. Um, so it's yes. very fun. And then on Mondays, definitely we're doing always um, for to support the NHS. We're uh, doing free double edge giveaways. So we're asking people to nominate. It doesn't need to be an NHS worker, but just anyone they think has been amazing during this uh, lockdown period. So whether it's a kind neighbor or your mother who's been bringing you soup or whatever um, on our Instagram and we're giving away uh, double edge packages and some gin and tonics and those kind of stuff. Awesome. Uh, and you, you, you obviously see it, you know, like myself, you think you think it's pretty important to keep in touch with your customers, to keep communicating with people. Um, and any, anything else that you've, you've kind of tried to see, you've got like, um, isolation packs and you're doing like getting people to do quarantine picks, all that engagement, I think is awesome. So yeah, anything else and what what's the feedback been like for you guys? Um, I think it's been really good. Um, I think it's a definitely a time to connect with uh, consumers. I think everyone's kind of more scrolling on their phones. Um, so maybe that's been a silver lining. Uh, I think people are more social and doing aperitifs over Skype and Zoom. And, and I think people are looking for a bit more experimentation. I mean, I, if I look at myself, I'm so bored. <laughs> I want to do whatever, something I haven't done before. I started running. It's something I literally haven't done for 15 years. Um, yeah. So I think it's all about offering different type of package. And like, for example, on our web shop, I, our isolation package is outselling any other thing that we have on the web shop. So is it? really shows uh, that people, yeah. 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 Uh -huh. As a hand sanitizer and some hand cream, some scented candles. So it's more lifestyle. Yeah. 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 Interesting. Maybe give you a few thoughts for the future. I'm sure you've already been thinking of that. Exactly. <laughs> it's a good time, isn't it? <laughs> Test things out. Uh, yeah. Tell me about your running because I, I've started running. I only started last year and I've hated running my whole life. And then in the last four weeks, I've done um, every Sunday. So I've done a, my, a 5K, which I've been doing for a year. And then I did my first 10K, my first 10 mile. And then last Sunday, I ran out and did a half marathon for the first time as well. What? Wow. Yeah. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> it's not so impressive with us. We started. Oh. Uh, about four weeks ago and then we've been doing like 5k every three days or every two days uh, awesome. and then we did 10k yesterday yeah, 10k yesterday you? Oh, okay, there you go. not miles yeah yeah well it took me a year to build up to that so well done yeah i think it just clear, it just clears my head to be honest yeah. with you and it's nice to get outside as well yeah. uh, love it yeah. um there's me wittering away. Got loads more questions for you girls. Uh, here we are. So can you tell Alec anything about the new flavors you're planning or are you going to keep those? <laughs> um, we are, we can be super vague. We're looking for delicious summary, refreshing flavors. <laughs> if you have any suggestions, always let us know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, Jazz says, top, top webinar today. Well done all. Thanks. Oh, very good. Uh, Chris says, um, yeah, I was going to ask you that one later, actually. So we'll ask you that one now. Do you use social media influencers? If so, have you found them useful? I've never, we've never used them uh, because it's so expensive. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. And then we tried it for the first time during dry January with three kind of semi big influencers. And um, Nope, I don't find it useful. <laughs> really? Interesting. Um, but maybe we're doing it wrong. Um, maybe I'm too skeptical. Maybe we're not targeting the right influencers. Um, maybe I, I just find it my Dutch cringeness finds it expensive. Um, I don't know. I think yeah. there must be a market for it, obviously. Yeah. And I think for some brands, it's really helped them go. I just think maybe for Double Dutch, it's quite niche. It's not, I don't know. It's not a it's fashion fast move. Brand. Yeah, I think fast, fast moving consumer goods. I don't know how well it works with our mm. kind of industry. Maybe I, I think don't listen to this. Sorry. <laughs> well, I'm no, do you know what? Really not, but... No, but you know, I was, I was chatting uh, to, um, a very big 
nail company who I, who again i won't name but about creating a podcast for them and they were looking to get away from the whole influencer marketing because said the last time they'd used that it was kind of law of diminishing returns i think this is the last time they'd used them and one of their um uh what would you call it? product endorsers was a kardashian and they said it had no effect on the new product launch that they that they because they just people because their, their explanation was because they wanted me to find like a bit more niche quirkier people that yeah. people probably haven't heard of like up and coming startups and stuff for a bit more punchier because they just said i think people are just seeing through it and going you're only saying that you wear these nails because you're getting paid yeah. to do it and therefore i'm not interested so i, I found that quite interesting well, and, and it's a trend again you know that people are seeing more and more through that kind of thing so i would maybe think that a connection would help that's i know yeah, me too that's yeah an expensive mistake yeah, i mean well, yeah yeah yeah, big mistake. I mean, yeah yeah it's expensive right <laughs> connection <laughs> yeah <laughs> um <laughs> it's just how expensive i don't know how expensive i didn't ask but it was like um it was the kardashian that's like the youngest Whoa. ever billionaire i've forgotten her name i'm over my head but yeah whatever her name is. yeah that's the one um crazy that's crazy i've got to go but um uh, let's have a quick look uh let's have a look uh i've got to skip past um let me let me go uh Dale. have you had any issues with people trying to use your ip hmm. not yet uh, no we have our own trademarks um and we had our cucumber watermelon is our most popular flavor we've had some of our great competitors launching cucumber flavors as well but then i think <laughs> on the you other don't hand, own cucumber <laughs> cucumber is not <laughs> it's not our vegetable <laughs> so if people want to do a cucumber because we made it so lovely they will never match our loveliness and deliciousness so they can try and do it and we'll run the world in a couple of years <laughs> <laughs> uh here's a good question um n3 i think that must be your postcode not your name but i'll read your question out because it's, it's a good question um i love what you're about and your work ethics i'm a startup lingerie brand for women with a large bust and a small frame i'm starting out on my own and it's a bit lonely how could i go about getting a partner um secondly i will need to raise money would you suggest getting an investor or going down the crowdfunding route there's two great questions actually so let me yeah. take one each. <laughs> I think for us, uh, on the founder, co-founder, I do think it's been amazing to have a co-founder. And we have friends that have started their business on themselves and it can be quite lonely. And I think the amazing thing is if you have a co-founder, you can really share your ups and downs together and you can lift each other up if there's downs. But the highs are also so much more fun. Um, mm. I do. We, and how do you find How do you find them? Sorry. Um, I'm also a little bit um, started with somebody else very early on. I think it's n it doesn't need to necessarily be a friend. Um, I think that's quite no, tricky. Definitely not. I think try and find somebody in your network that really has a complementary experience. Obviously, you need to get along on a personal level. Um, but I think there's lots of networking events in London. I mean, let, I assume they're now virtual for people on both ways yeah. that are trying to find a co-founder um a lot of accelerator programs are offering founder uh, matches and those kind of things um yeah yeah i think it also doesn't need to be a co-founder you can also take someone on that's kind of like your white hand um give them some options exactly. give them li little yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly and then you also have kind of someone that you can combine in uh in everything so I think it could be on investment. We always we raised for investment rounds so far. From the beginning, we um, start. We looked at crowdfunding versus uh, individual investors, and then VC firms and kind of institutional. We never went down the uh, crowdfunding route because for us, we started it in a industry that we didn't really know a lot of. We didn't have any experience in the food and beverage industry and we were quite young and we were in a country that we didn't know anyone. So we wanted people on board that could actually really help us. And I think crowdfunding is great to get more brand ambassadors and to kind of help sales, but it doesn't really help on the bigger strategy picture and kind of 
helping with your next investment round or helping with network helping with distribution yeah. and sales opportunities so i think for us that has been super helpful and we do have passive investors that are still helpful and we have a few more active investors that are extremely helpful and i think it is a good I do think we have a lot on our investors, so I do definitely would recommend it. Uh, and then on our last investment round, we it was kind of time to go with institutional, but then last minutely decided to do just a bigger round again with a few higher net worth um, individuals. And glad we did. Uh, we it's slightly more informal. Um, I think it's a bit you need to. Take the comparison on, or like, have a good think on what you want. Do you want investors that, in a sense, private investors are always going to have their opinions? They're always going to, whether they're either they're passive, they still have opinions and feedback, and you need to listen to them. And even if you want to only, if you only see them three times a year, it's still an opinion with crowdfunding. You don't have that at all. So I think if you're super confident that you 100% know what you're doing, that you know your industry, you don't need a network that helps you. And maybe crowdfunding yeah. is an easier way moving forward. Definitely. Uh, but I for do us, think... it was 100% the right decision. Yeah, yes, definitely. Mm. I have no regret for that. But I do think also crowdfunding used to get a lot more press and coverage yeah. than it does now yeah. because it has become really competitive. Yeah. So, yeah. That's a... Yeah. Yeah, no, that great answers. Great answers. Both both of those. And um, I, I agree, you know, when you... When you're you're on your own, Natalie, and she's posted up uh, Natalie Joseph, her name is founder of Natalie Joseph Lingerie. Um, it, it is it is lonely, and and I think I've seen a friend who's got a PR agency do exactly uh, what Raisa said there. With instead of taking somebody on as a co-founder, she took somebody on as a right-hand person and gave them you know shares shares in the business. And you know there's a lot of lean on you, you can get with with somebody like that. Um, and, and I think you're spot on, you know, networking events. And again, likewise, I'm assuming they've all gone digital. We, we were meant to have hundreds of networking uh, sessions over like two days last week in, in uh, Olympia, which obviously didn't happen. But I'm assuming those organizations have, have gone online. And as you kind of alluded to as well, there are certain organizations like Antler, which I'm an, an advisor for, who literally uh, do like a six week accelerator program where you all jump in together, you're meant to come up with the idea for the business, meet your co-founder whilst you're actually on that program as well. So um, there's Entrepreneur First is another one. So there's a couple of those out there. Um, I would just say, again, you know, speak to your network, um, you know, put it out there that you are looking for someone as well and, and put that out to your network as well and see what comes yeah. back and maybe, maybe write down the type of person that you're looking for as well before you actually get to that stage could be, could be helpful. Yeah. Um, and again, investment wise, yeah, a friend of mine today, Damien Lee from Mr. Lee's Noodles, he just raised 1.75 million on crowdfunding. He just announced it today, did that in two weeks, which is pretty good to launch in the US. Um, and that's probably like you said, that's probably the biggest one that I've heard in, in, in quite a while because it's such a competitive space. But um, I, I think you're right as well. When you're getting private investors, you're getting their knowledge um, as well. So it's again, Natalie, it's, it's do you want that? Do you want silent investors? who you know you do crowdfunding kind of building that tribe um of, of interest that brand awareness that you get from doing something like that but everyone who's done crowdfunding has told me it literally is another job as well as running your business it's like taking on another 95 yeah. 60 hour a week 70 hour a week job putting that program together so um do think long and hard about yeah. that and here's a bit more of a light-hearted question from warren thank <laughs> you warren which gin do you feel really complements your product just for research purposes obviously <laughs> Good research. Um, we have, because we have 10 flavors, uh, our cucumber watermelon works really well with more citric gins. Our pomegranate and basil works more with herbal gins, so it's different for all. Um, mm. But some brands that I really love at the moment, phew, there's um, so a lot. Um, Josh, do you want to... I feel bad for the ones that we're not mentioning then. <laughs> <laughs> I think from the bigger brands, Probably uh, Gin Mare, Monkey 47 goes both really well with uh, a pomegranate and basil. For small brands, like for example, Whittaker's Gin, Mason Gin goes really well with or cucumber watermelon. Um, least, um, if you want to have a slow gin or um, a rhubarb gin, 
Because Sweetie Belle with the ginger ale or double lemon. We're launching our a whole kind of spirits web shop on our um, spirits um, shop on our web shop in two weeks' time. So you'll see our favorite brands there. <laughs> awesome. I love that idea. Um, uh, yeah, this chap or, or lady propagates is, is the, the username they've got, but they put thanks for the webinar and refreshing honesty. I used to head up Britvic soft drinks channel marketing account and also worked internationally for Guinness Brewing worldwide. I now run an independent marketing agency helping open up new distribution and drive through for challenger brands. So feel, feel, please feel free to connect for some uh, free of charge input. Uh, oh, it's Jane. So Jane Howarth. There you go. LinkedIn there to have a little look um if you get the time um there you go and this will this will be on there that, you know for the replays as well um this this won't disappear um so clearly everybody could ask you questions all day but you've got a business to run so i will finish with the last couple of questions you can give really brief answers and then i'll wrap up because we've literally got about three or four minutes left um my god so many questions my god we've got loads of questions again you are super popular um uh, <laughs> Ramali says, so he's got a teenage son. Um, how did you juggle between your studies and your business? My teenage son has started a business and this seems quite a challenge with schoolwork and extracurricular activities. We uh, didn't really juggle between, because we started Double Dutch after university and did our thesis about Double Dutch during university. So we didn't work and um, study together actually. It was one big But I do project. think it complements each other and with 100% um, um, Push your son to keep doing that's amazing yeah i agree i agree um elon says you've already done partnerships with liquor brands what kind of brands do you want to work with in the future uh i think brands that share the same vision as us um that are going that are all about kind of flavor fun flavor experimentation that are about uh, sustainability and natural ingredients and best ingredients. And I think it can also be lifestyle. I think yeah, it can be certainly. homeware. It can be, it doesn't need to be in the drinks and food, uh, yeah. industry. Yeah. Good, good, good answer. Um, <clears throat> let's have a quick look. Uh, so many questions. Let me just go. Uh, how much of your company, uh, ah, how much of your company were you willing to give away to get the investment? And would you give that amount if you had your time again? Again, you can choose to answer that or not answer that. <laughs> I would still give away the same as, as we did. Okay. Um, because yeah. I think I'd much rather have a small portion of a really big company than a big portion of a smaller company. And I think we, we wanted to accelerate our growth and we needed to raise investments quickly after each other for bigger amounts. Um, and I'm, I would totally do the same. Yeah, that's a great answer, I think, 100%. I totally agree with you. I'd rather own something of something than rather than you know than have nothing at the end of the day that you but keeping have. majority is really important so yeah yeah good point <laughs> um thank you for those valuable answers as natalie i live in london and was networking so now doing so online but it's better to get a rapport with someone face to face that was natalie with the lingerie brand yeah absolutely good luck natalie i hope you go well with that uh chris says, do you employ a social media manager or do you try and do it yourself we did, always used to do it ourselves um and then you know how it goes that you forget about it, you forget about it and it wasn't really consistent but this time has the, has made us realize that we need a social media manager yeah okay and you do this aside to that do you focus much on personal brands or is it all about the brand <laughs> um i don't have any personal social media myself so it's all double edge but we are we definitely do push ourselves forward with double edge as uh face of it i think it's finding a balance yeah 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 i agree um natalie said would you ever consider crowdfunding first then get an investor on the next round of funding yeah yeah certainly yeah. sure uh, monica says are you thinking of launching sodas well, our cucumber, watermelon, pong in a basil, cranberry and ginger, they're all sodas already. Um, so yeah, definitely expanding the soda range. Nice. So I've got, uh, you probably know Dan, Dan Broughton from Dalston's Sodas. Yes, yes. Yeah, of course. Yeah, got, yeah, I thought you did. I've got Dan on in a couple of weeks. I think it might even be next week, actually. Yeah. Oh, nice. um, nice. Yeah, good guy. Good guy. Yeah. yeah. We love Dan. <laughs> yeah. I thought you'd know each other. Um, I saw Dan probably last summer, so it's good to similar to you guys. So it'd be good to good to catch up with him again. So yeah, anyone who um, wants to jump on next week, 
um got some more nice food and drinks brands so um last question then here we go uh warren says thanks ladies wishing you incredible success top job alex you're welcome warren uh, so mr says have you tried all of your competitors uh, competitors as part of product research and that'll be your last question because it's gone three o'clock and i know you've got business to run <laughs> you're probably not actually we don't really focus so much on competition and try to do just our own stuff but the big ones obviously um but definitely not everyone we should uh, well the the very painful thing is is that if you need to try your competitors you need to pay money and <laughs> give them money yeah <laughs> feels wrong. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um do you want me to put in um so thank you everybody there's loads of kind words coming in for romali louise saying thank you thank you thank you um that's brilliant so many questions that was such a super engaged webinar that's awesome um and you've clearly got a very popular following for, to get all we don't normally get all these questions like this i have to tell you did a webinar yesterday uh didn't have one question for a whole hour <laughs> thank you everyone thank you if you, um, all, you all get a 10 percent discount code double dutch party in capital letters on our web shop double dutch drinks.com and then you can enjoy an unlimited 10 percent discount for the rest of your life <laughs> so that is double double dutch party in um capitals is that right i'm typing it in exactly double dutch party and the website is i should know this obviously www.doubledutchdrinks.com of course <laughs> Drinks. Okay. okay, there we go, everybody. All tied in. Awesome. Well, thank you both very much indeed. That's brilliant. Absolutely love that. That was great chatting to you. Could chat to you all day, uh, as could our audience, clearly. Um, and I wish you all the best in Belgium and hopefully catch up with you when you're, you're back over in London. Hopefully, the light at the end of the tunnel will hear some news tomorrow, maybe. Um, I know. Start to open up. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, everyone, and thank you, thank Alex. Thank you, that'd be great. Thank Thanks, you. ladies. Bye, Bye. now. Bye.